Good afternoon. I want you guys to think of a phrase. Touch the stars. What does it mean to you? To most people, it seems a ludicrousy, an oxymoron, if you think about it literally. How can you touch stars when they are so far away, so hot, so just untouchable? Yet this is precisely the title of an astronomy book I received at the age of 10. But it was no ordinary astronomy book. It was a braille book with braille pictures, usually called tactile graphics, of the stars, planets, and galaxies. Running my fingers over those shaker dots took me to those places, and I just had to know more about them. A foreword by the first blind radio astronomer encouraged me and gave me hope that an astronomical career was achievable. But to know more about the objects in my book, I had to know more about science. I plunged in at every opportunity, including sneaking volumes out of an eighth grade book during seventh and attending an aviation-based magnet program for high school. There, my world changed when I took my first physics course. Physics was incredible for me. It was not a collection of boring facts and useless formulae. It came alive. Each variable was a character, its place in an equation determined by its relationship with others. Some fought constantly like opposing forces, while others worked together like thrust and lift to accomplish a greater goal. I wasn't just solving problems in physics class. I was predicting the future, making things happen. But there was always a danger. Our teachers stressed the consequences of being wrong in our field could be severe, that of fire and metal, of high altitudes and low tolerances. They'd always say, you can't park an airplane on a cloud. As I entered college, I took the lessons I learned in physics to heart. But as the work became harder, I realized something. As great as Braille and tactile graphics are, they have limitations when you're talking about complex concepts. When I took multivariable calculus a couple years ago, I developed a partnership with Chris Williams of the Dreams Laboratory. We worked together to create three-dimensional models of the shapes and graphics needed for the coursework. Again, the models made the math come alive. I could perceive every detail of a model much clearer than a tactile graphic. I could turn the shape in space depending on whatever orientation the problem required. I made the shape work for me to reach my goal. The shape that I have here is mathematically called an ellipsoid, but most people would just say it looked like a bar of soap or a rock. And if you look at it closely, or you can come up and feel it. You can run your finger along and realize that there are actually ellipses on the surface of this shape, all over the shape. I can turn it, I can move it around, and actually there's a video of me playing with more of these shapes that I'd like to show you guys right now. So wait, when she's talking about like the max and min, and stuff like that. Is this kind of how it how it changes? So, um, ask a question, please, Chelsea. Oh, I'm just kind of exploring the shape and yeah, yeah, trying yeah, yeah, to yeah. relate it back to what I've learned mathematically. Cool. So first off, um, that shape when you graph it has a special has a specific orientation. Oh, it does. Right, so we've, we've just given you the shape. So in fact, sorry, if I can borrow it for a second. Yeah. Um, so you can um, touch it again to see where, it's, where it is. There it is. Okay. So that, give or take, if you just let it alone on a table, is yeah. sort of its proper orientation. Oh, okay. I thought it could change your orientation. Well, it kind of depends on what we're using it for. Oh. Right, we, we're, we're still working out some of these details. <laughs> so in fact, let me, let me point you to... Um, move your left hand a tiny bit to the perfect. Now this one, give or take, that's its proper orientation. Right? It's, it's not especially important. 
but you can feel what the maximum feels like. Yeah. So when she's talking about a maximum, she's talking about something that feels like that. Oh, cool. You catch what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, now a little bit further to your left is another graph. I'm gonna have to hold it in place a little bit. That's what a minimum feels like. You catch what I'm saying? Oh, this is so cool. I, I don't know, it just, seeing them actually in the third dimension just yeah. brings the math so much better. Cool. Cool, 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 right? Yeah. So now let's go back to the one that's all the way on your right, the first one you're holding. This one? This is an example of a saddle point. Yeah. So feel that thing in the middle. If you run your, perfect, if you run your finger in that direction, mm -hmm. you feel how it kind of goes up. Yeah. And that feels a little bit like the minimum. Yeah. Right? But now run your finger in sort of this direction sideways. Oh, sideways. Feel how it goes, you feel how it goes down. Oh, okay. Which is a little bit like the maximum in your left hand. Yeah. So this one that's in your right hand is called a saddle point. Because in one direction it goes up like the minimum, so you might think it's a minimum. Yeah. But in the other direction it goes down like the maximum. Oh, okay. So you might think it's a maximum, but it ends up being neither. Neither. That's what a saddle point is. I guess I was confused when she was this oh, oh shit. I guess I was confused because when she was describing it in class, because I, I guess I thought in effect, I, I didn't know she was switching, switching axes, switching directions. Yeah, and that, that's part of the, the challenge of trying to communicate this to you without being able to draw pictures <laughs> or give you models like yeah. this. Yeah, this makes sense now. Good, 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 good. That's a start. See, it's just multi. Makes sense. It, it's easy when you have the right tools. So it's actually projects like these, the 3D models, others that I've worked on that have shown me that any concept, any idea, any action that you can think about can be achieved if the correct interfaces for the job are developed, if you think about the right tools. Take astronomy. You've all long thought of astronomy as a visual science, yet Almost all the important work today is done in wavelengths that humans themselves cannot process. We must build our instruments to be our eyes. Yet those zeros and ones, we collect them from the stars. What do we do? We put them right back into the optical spectrum. Why? Because it's comforting for us. It's a familiar medium. We are used to it. But what channels are out there that we are ignoring? What does the physics and the universe want us to know? What might I discover that others will miss because they don't know where or how or the right places to look? When I was 10, the phrase touch the stars meant I could look at the images in my astronomy book and have access to pictures that I had never seen before, objects I hadn't even imagined, and now, the phrase is so much more. It sparks adventure, excitement, a yearning to explore. And that yearning to explore, whether it be in our solar system or the deepest theoretical resources of a black hole, has never left. The concept of a blind astronaut may seem foreign, even impossible now. But what innovations in interface design will make it happen in the future? What puzzle pieces of technology are there today, just waiting to be utilized in precisely the right way? As a scientist, I have learned many things. Never stop exploring. Seize every opportunity afforded to you. Keep the word impossible out of your vocabulary. My dream of space flight just happens to be literal and real. But if you do these things and never stop dreaming, you too will be able to touch the stars. Thank you.